welcome to this week's edition of CEO Corner. I'm Otis Rawl, President and CEO of the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce, and I'm happy to have with me today uh, Gresham Barrick, the congressman from the 3rd District and gubernatorial candidate. Uh, Gresham, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Odie. Glad to be here. Well, uh, a couple months ago you sat here and we talked about federal issues. Uh, yeah. I think we'd maybe talk a little bit about federal issues too, but uh, as far as the business community is concerned, I think we really want to start focusing on what's good for South Carolina and what Gresham Barrett's thoughts are as sure. we move forward. So, summer recess is going on right now. You're home, you're in the district, uh, issues in Washington. I know one that's uh, dear to your heart is energy, yeah. uh, trying to provide reliable, predictable energy for not only the citizens of South Carolina, but also for our country. What's going on in Washington and how, you, how do you think all that flushes out in the end with cap and trade and nuclear and stuff like that? Well, it's amazing, Odie, because uh, the American people are starting to realize what uh, this Democrat House and Democrat Senate is proposing and, and in many cases in the House has passed. Uh, we've been talking about health care. It's still in the House. We haven't, it hasn't come out of committee. We'll take that up when we get back. But as you well know, cap and trade has passed the House. It's in the Senate right now. And when you think about South Carolina, most customers out there are co-op customers, and they will tell you the average co-op bill is about $147 to $150 per month. Right. If cap and trade passes and is signed by the president in its present form right now, Odie, that bill will go from $150 a month to $400 a month. And people don't understand what impact it has uh, across this state and across this nation. You know, even though South Carolina produces about 51% of its power by nuclear, we export a lot of that power, right. so our carbon footprint is extremely high. And as we know this week, uh, Santee Cooper pulled the plug on the, on the new coal-fired plant in South Carolina, which I guess does make good economic sense in today's environment, but you know as well as I do, yep. we've got to replace that base load. One of the things that I've been pushing for South Carolina in this nation is clean nuclear energy. Right. We've got two nuclear reactors on the board in South Carolina right now, uh, two at the VC Summer site, uh, two at the Lee site up in Cherokee County. Odie, those are $10 billion investments which right. create real jobs, real economic growth, lowers the cost of doing business in South Carolina, uh, reduces our carbon footprint. So if anything does pass, and I don't think that the Senate or the House version will right. pass in its, in its present form, but if something does pass, it, it certainly puts South Carolina in a better position to be more competitive, uh, to keep our, our rates lower, especially for our citizens, and, and, and better yet than, uh, than that, uh, help keep our, our nation safe and strong. Well, you know what's interesting? If you ask a question to, to taxpayers in, a, in an environment where they only got to answer that question without really knowing what the back end looks like or what the That's repercussions, right. they'll, they'll answer the question one way. And I think. That's where we find it tough is to be able to educate our taxpayers. And when I say our taxpayers, that means the employees of our, the people that work for our businesses. But I think this whole cap and trade issue is, is, is a lot bigger than a lot of people think from That's a right. cost standpoint. And if people knew how much it was going to cost them uh, on their residential electricity and, and maybe ultimately in jobs, particularly if you've got high users that rely on low cost predictable electricity, all of a sudden it goes out of the, out, you know, the rates go just so much, so high that they can't afford it, and all of a sudden they start looking offshore. That's a, that brings a whole new light to what cap right. and trade can do. So That's right. And, and business is always going to take the path of least, least resistance. And, you know, if, if we've got businesses and industries out there, which we do right now, that are operating on such a tight margin, Odie, uh, when you raise their overhead to a point where they become unprofitable. Yeah. You've got one of two decisions. You either go out of business or you move. And if they move, they're not going to Georgia or North Carolina. Right. They're going offshore somewhere. Yeah. Well, you know, we've, if we've gone across the state, we're doing our grassroots meetings now and we've talked to our CEOs and I, I'm, I'm going to let you answer this question and I'm going to tell you kind of what, what we're hearing. But uh, as you go around the state and running for governor, what are you hearing as the main issues that are facing the people of South Carolina? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you two. Um, the first one is one more jobs. And it's job for us too. Absolutely. It, it's empowering people and not government. It's creating an environment and government does have a role. We've got a role to, to set, the, set the table, so to speak. It's the old baseball movie. You build it and they will come and then get the heck out of the way. But it's surprising. The other comment that we keep hearing more and more is people in South Carolina, businessmen and women, want a governor that can make government work. Right. That can get the politics out, come up with common sense solutions, that can, care, that can be carried out and take South Carolina forward, and it's amazing. 
Well, do you have a, if, if you put enough meat on the bone, as they would say, around what your jobs or economic development uh, platform for look like, what are you going to be focusing on? Yeah. Three things, I mean, we, we've been talking about three specific areas, economic development, education, and energy. Uh, but on the economic development end, we've, we've concentrated on three specific areas, Odie. Number one is the ports. Right. And, and you know how vital the ports are to South Carolina. One of every ten jobs is directly related to the port, and it has a, roughly between 11 and, and 12 billion dollar multiplier. It's twice the state budget. Right. So having a port that is viable, uh, that is strong, that is progressive, that is the gateway to the East Coast, especially when the Panama Canal is open, is extremely important. I mean, when I think about my neck of the woods, you know, when I think about Michelin, BMW, Fuji, right. uh, companies that probably would not even be in South Carolina would it not be for a strong port. So making sure that is up and running and remains viable, extremely important. Number two is infrastructure. And when people think about infrastructure, so many times they think about roads and bridges. Very important. But it's more than that, Odie. It's roads, it's bridges, it's water, it's sewer, it's light rail, it's heavy rail, uh, it's internet interconnectivity. Right. Making sure that when businesses and industries are looking to, to place somewhere, that we're shovel ready. And I'll give you a perfect example. When Volkswagen came looking in South Carolina, they were looking in my district, and we had the property, and we said, okay, we'll put you the roads, we'll put you the power, we'll put you the sewer in. Yeah. They said, great, that's fine, we appreciate it. We're going to Tennessee because you know why? We can start digging tomorrow because it's already there. So having a plan for our infrastructure statewide, gotcha. how we take care of that, not just the upstate, not just the Midlands, not just the lower part of the state, but collectively how we bring that together, extremely important. And then the th not to interrupt you, yeah, but I sure. think another, another thing that you need that's not necessarily infrastructure, but it part, goes piece, parts and parcel to that, is the whole regulatory environment that businesses have to go through in, in the states. And what we're finding is, you, you talk about infrastructure and right. having all that ready, you got to have a process on the regulatory side that makes it easy for businesses right. to get in here that's and right. get shovel ready too. So make sure you put that somewhere in what you're doing. Now, well, you, well, now wait, wait, you jumped ahead because my third part is regulatory reform. Okay. And, and, okay. It, and it, it includes three parts. Okay. Number one is government. Okay. You know, we've got a, a 21st century business environment out there. We've got government in many cases, Odie, that's still operating in the 18th century. Right. That's the first part of regulatory reform. Second is just what you're talking about, rules and regulations to make it easier to do business in South Carolina. But the third part is taxation. You know, too many times in the past we've looked at grocery tax or property tax or sales tax. We've got to come back and look at taxation holistically. You know, the track Act is coming back in March of next year. It'll give the new governor an opportunity to bring a package to the floor to say, this is what we want to do in its entirety. And we're actually looking at the New Mexico plan right now, uh, okay. Napolitano left. She left a billion dollars in debt in New Mexico. They've come up with a good plan that they're working right now. The, their legislature is, is massaging right. it. I think it's got some good ideas and some possibilities for South Carolina. I know it does.